Tak. Uh, so I have a question for Guy. Here, over here. Uh, do you um, do you detect some kind of an interferon response, either gamma or alpha, or beta, or or either DNA or RNA responses that may help explain some of the uh, phenomena? Um, yeah, actually we did. So um, I guess in, in general viruses are known to be uh, a good um, mediator of interferon uh, responses and uh, actually I guess um, all tumor cells actually in our hands um, we, we tried, they um, have a robust uh, interferon response uh, actually, also interferon gamma, which is uh, then subsequently leading also to PDL1 uh, enhanced PDL1 expression. This is something we could uh, detect in a variety of uh, very different uh, solid tumor cells, including melanoma cells and colorectal cancer cells as well. But do you see kind of like, like sting or sea gas or rig eye? Um. Um, so, so we did not look in rig eye so far. Other labs. Uh, did that, and then they could um, show, uh, obviously, especially Rick Eyes, one of the key uh, candidates, which is uh, uh, known to be to be triggered by, by, I guess, nearly any kind of, of viral uh, agent, especially of the uh, negative stranded RNA viruses. Thank you. Dr. Sue? Hi. Um, I'm just thinking that a lot of the cell-based therapy and the TCR therapies and stuff, we need to sort of look for antigens like mage, et cetera. Do you think there's a, p a place for us to actually do these kinds of pre-screening in advance so that patients don't have to wait till they are ready and then you have to wait for those results? And you know, we do this for mutational profiling now on a fairly regular basis. Do you think there, that's something that we can do concurrently rather than you know, sequentially so that it could be multiplexed? Yeah, I mean, uh there's the potential of doing screening through methylation patterns through, so you could, genomics could also look at methylation patterns for expression of, of uh, tumor antigens. Um, but I think that that would, this strat, especially if we had more than one, uh, more than one antigen that we're going after so that you could look at a panel of antigens, I think that would be a strategy. Yeah, and also the other strategy could be, you know, make a bank of, you know, the, the tumor-specific, you know, T-cell power donors, and that's, you know, the effort has been started in the States, at least for the B-virus, yeah, specific T-cells, yeah. yeah. Hello. Um, for the bispecific antibodies, can you use anti-PD-1 instead of CD3? Theoretically, sure, I think. Would I that just, be more specific, like, because they would only attract activated T cells? Um, possibly. I've, I've not seen anyone trying to do that um, with, with an antibody yet that I'm aware of. I don't know if you guys have come across anything, but... Um, no, no, that's an interesting idea. Uh, Anti-PD-1, yeah to take the tumor-specific T cell or activate. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the question was whether uh, an anti-PD-1 uh, bite might link to link cells that are PD-1 positive to an anti-CD and the tumor antigen. Yeah, Hi, uh, for I think the point of their mechanism targeting there, there may, one sorry, there just may not be any, those T cells may, may still not function appropriately with that antibody binding it, so it's an open question. Okay. I mean, it might, might silence down the T cell activity as well. I'm, I'm not sure. Next question? <laughs> yeah. So for uh, therapies targeting one specific antigen, is there any signs of antigen escape where tumors just downregulate one specific antigen that CAR or TCR, transgenic TCR is targeted against? Uh, yeah, there is evidence of, in some instances of antigen loss variants that in, when you target a single antigen, especially if it's not required for that tumor to survive. So um, you also can see responses in patients who have a minority of, of cells that express a particular antigen. So adoptive cell therapy can result in an epitope spreading and a productive immune response to more than one antigen. Um, also, one more question for Dr. Uh, Hirano. 
So you mentioned that CAR, CD, CAR therapy, CD19, is one of the more effective uh, therapy in clinic, whereas other targets are not as, as effective, and you're looking for different generations. Is that to improve the efficacy for other antigen targets, or is that to improve? Yeah, so actually we use CD19 as uh, the model because it's very bit too, it's easy to make a comparison within conventional, current generation car. And we were working to apply this, you know, the concept to the other, you know, car concepts targeting the solid chamber engine. Hi. So um, I suppose we've talked about there, but for anyone, um, just in one of your slides, you showed the clinical trial um, summary. There, it seemed that the younger patients had better outcomes over long term. I was just wondering if anyone can comment on immunosenescence and particularly, say, age-related impairment of dendritic cells in, in the context of immunotherapy and um, adoptive cell transfer. There, I mean, there. Certainly, there's been some reports with CAR therapy that the uh, T cells that are engineered that are less antigen experienced, maybe younger, more have higher proliferative capacity, are more effective. So there has been uh, that association. The, the pediatric population is a different type of a yeah, letter. Yeah. Hematologists speak to, to this question like in terms of CAR, cancers. but that's one of the other issues as well. Yeah, certainly the disease biology you'd expect could be different. It might be difficult to tease out differences in the, in the clinical trials. Age hasn't been a predictor in any of the, the studies that have been looked at in lymphoid malignancy, to my knowledge. I just have a question, two questions, actually. One of them is a little wild. The first one is, how do you address the issues of systemic delivery of oncolytic viruses so that you could get the viruses to... Uh, multiple systemic tumors and allow them to replicate there is, are, what are the barriers and how do you overcome those barriers? And the other question I have for Naoto is, is it possible to engineer a T cell to uh, carry a virus and release a virus upon triggering of the T cell receptor? So could you combine those two fields together? So I, I guess I tried to answer uh, question number one. Um, so with oncolytic viruses, one, one uh, uh, solution uh, might be the, the route of administration, and obviously we rely in the moment on both local and, and systemic administration, and in some studies we only administer the virus locally um, for a good reason. Um, another uh, way to answer this is actually um, that we uh, can increase the sheer dose of the virus, and if we do so, um, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Clinic people, Stephen Russell, um, uh, was uh, launching a trial in multiple myeloma, and he treated with a single agent uh, measles virus, uh, which was given systemically. And he could clearly show that if you reach a certain threshold, uh, which is for measles uh, uh, 10 to the 9 particles, actually, uh, or higher, uh, then he could obtain like a nice tumor homing uh, with a single shot of measles, which was uh, really going to the plasmosotum uh, nests in, in the body and, and could find the tumor cells, actually. So it's a matter of the uh, route of administration, I would say, it's a matter of um, uh, the sheer dose. It's also a matter of um, the, the patient, obviously. I mean, the multiple myeloma patients obviously don't have uh, lots of IgG uh, response left, so this might be an idea uh, patient for systemic delivery for that reason. Um, another way to approach this is our envelope exchange strategy to take another uh, envelope from another virus which is closely related but not a human pathogen. So at least for the first administration, we don't face the human response we, we have for, for measles viruses. And maybe the last um, uh, comment on this question, um, another way could, could be just to uh, find a rational uh, modulation of, of the immune system prior to virus administration. For example, in terms of fusing cyclophosphamide or anything where we know we have uh, like a time window of opportunity where we lower innate immunity or, or whatever uh, and, and uh, immunocompromise the patient in a way uh, for a time, give the virus and, and then wait that uh, the immune system comes back and can help to fight the cancer. Yeah, I think it's a great study. One of the strategies to help the, you know, the, the trafficking of the tumor t, t cells, so, you know, tumor microenvironment. Maybe you can, the, you can, you know, have the T cells to express the two receptors which recognize the virus as well as the tumors, and you know, that way you may be able to force, you know, the trafficking of tumors, you know, to the tumor site. Yeah. One of the issues, obviously, you know, the, the adoptive T cell therapy is how you can have, you know, the T cell traffic to the tumor site, because you know, at least in the mouse studies and other human studies, so the 90% 90, 90 of, you know, infused T cells are gonna trap at the lung. 
So it's pretty easy to, you know, to eradicate the tumors at the lung, but the you know, majority of the T cells doesn't go to, do not go to the periphery other than lung. So that's one of the big issues in this field. All right, we have two more questions. Uh, Tack. So, um, Guy, uh, is there, I mean, obviously when you get your measles virus and you get one burst and then when it, the existing antibodies against the measles virus or antibody that are built up during uh, the, the challenge uh, will have prevented subsequent replication um, and thereby uh, eliminate uh, all possibility of future measles virus generated boosting up the immune response. Um, is there, are you, are, do you have a second virus to come back and a third virus to make sure that you can get the multiple kicks and the can? Um, yeah, well, um, in preclinical settings, we have a couple of viruses, uh, including a canine distemper virus or Tupia virus, which is an unclassified paramyxovirus as well, um, or Salem virus. So we have different candidates uh, where we tried an envelope exchange, and this is uh, quite possible, not in, in every case, but, but in some of them. Um, so many of these chimeric viruses um, don't generate higher, high titers um, as compared to the parental viral, uh, virus. Um, so um, that might be a problem we need to, to make more, more engineering for. Um, so, I mean, in the far future, I, I, I see that, that, that we have like, like a couple of viruses in our pocket uh, we can use subsequently. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, for the, for the early trials now, obviously we, we rely on the, um, on the, the measles virus uh, vaccine strain. And, and, and maybe we, we actually don't, don't need much more than, a sec, uh, than one shot of, of our agent if we are going to combine uh, this agent with, um, for example, checkpoint blockade antibodies or adoptive uh, cell transfer uh, so, so that there's no need for a further um, um, administration uh, to achieve uh, more uh, of an oncolytic effect. Um, in terms of uh, boostering a response, there one answer to the question could be indeed again to use two different viruses. Um, so we distract the immune system uh, by one virus and we give another virus, which is completely different, um, to have at least a second shot. Yeah, the, the issue was raised before uh, about expressing oncolytic viruses uh, in, a, in a T cell. One of the interesting um, discoveries that was made recently is Wendell Lim's Synotch system, where in response to, a, to an, an antigen similarly to kind of to a, to a car, uh, you can drive expression of, of whatever you want, and that's actually used um, for, for, for conferring uh, bi-antigenic specificity upon a, a T cell. Um, this is an issue which doesn't seem to have been discussed very much this morning. Um, a question uh, to uh, Gangrex is, are there any um, schemes that have been elaborated for um, for targeting multiple antigens, because as we all know, no matter how, how good antigen-specific approaches are, you will always be limited by the fact of antigen escape. So are there any approaches for uh, oncolytic viruses that have been thought about or conceived? Um, so uh, dependent on, on the vector platform you are using, the coding capacity is quite different. So the power virus I've, I've shown uh, with the one trial, it's a very small 5 KB, 5 KB virus and the coding capacity is very limited to 300 base pairs, actually. Um, with measles, we can go up to 2 or 3 KB. That's, that's much better. That would allow us to, um, to have like a polycystronic multi-epitope um, cassette in, inserted, so we are able to, to address different antigens using the very same virus. Another strategy uh, could be to um, just mix a population of different viruses coding for um, uh, different uh, antigens, um, so um, doing this would allow us to, to address um, uh, this issue as well. And there are other viruses like vaccinia and the big uh, DNA viruses uh, uh, which allow much more uh, of a coding capacity, so there you are more or less unlimited in encoding any kind of peptide you, you desire. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, we will now break for lunch and start again at uh, 1.15.